Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to a virtual event uh, through Arinda Books. I am so excited to be able to present Mark Kurlansky, who will be in conversation with Mary Vollmer. Um, Mark has written, I think, over 35 books I read recently. I think I've only re read six of them. Um, they're all wonderful. His most recent book, The Importance of Not Being Earnest, really caught my attention because I'm a huge Hemingway fan as well. So, but Mark's books really run the gamut from, um, I have it here for a minute, Havana, which I was going to hold up to show you, but I don't know what I did with it, um, cod, salt, salmon, milk, and many others. Those are the ones that come to mind right now. Um, it's almost impossible to sum up all of your achievements and accolades. I printed them out and it's uh, several pages long. Uh, you are a journalist, a writer. Um, I was most interested in the fact that you have uh, worked as a commercial fisherman and a paralegal and a pastry chef. So we might be able to call you a Renaissance man. Um, I don't want to take up a lot of time reading your whole list of accomplishments. If we run out of time, then I will. But um, needless to say, you have won numerous uh, literary awards. And I think that we are in for a real treat this afternoon. Mary Vollmer, as many of you may know, um, is local here in Orinda, one of our favorite customers. She has written two books, um, Crown of Dust and Reliance, Illinois. And she teaches at St. Mary's College. And she has started, I'm going to get this wrong, the Alta Mesa Center for the Arts. Is that right, Mary? Did I get that right? Yeah. Uh, which is an effort she's embarked upon to bring uh, artists, well, that you just got, but bring poets, writers, various artists to um, local audiences, uh, mostly around the theme of social justice, if I have that right. So, I am going to turn it over now to Mary and Mark. Well, thank you, Mark. It's a it's a real pleasure. You know, I went into the library and I was thinking, well, I'm just going to collect all of his books and have a stack there. And I I went for a hike. I mean, I went through every section of the Dewey Decimal System. I had to stop and found <laughs> throughout the library something else that you had written about, and it was just it was it was mind boggling the the curiosity that 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 has moved you through your life. So it's a real, it's a real pleasure. Um, I first came across your book in Middlewich, England, which is a salt capital of Cheshire and, and found salt. So that was my, that was my first taste, if you will, of, of your work. But, um, but it's a real pleasure to, to speak about Hemingway and this parallel memoir biography that you've written, the importance of not being earnest. How, how did this book, begin for you? What was the first spark? Oddly enough, it began while fly fishing. <laughs> this is absolutely true. I, uh, I fish on uh, a river in Idaho called the Big Wood, which is a tributary of the Columbia, as are all Idaho rivers, uh, that runs through the town of Ketchum. And, you know, the thing I like about fly fishing is that it's the only time that I'm not thinking about anything else. Uh, I think the reason I became a writer and the reason I've written so many books is I have this constant dialogue in my head. But I don't when I'm fishing. When I'm fishing, I'm trying to figure out about insect hatches and the flow of the river and trying to think like a trout. Um, <clears throat> but I was, I was casting uh, on the opposite a trench along the opposite bank and of course, I was thinking about flies, and I, I, it suddenly popped into my mind that Hemingway used to fish in the big wood with two drops, three flies. I thought, hmm, should I do that? <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> and then I remember that I was just very close on that opposite bank to the spot where he blew his head off. Uh. And, um, and then I was lost. I wasn't thinking like a trout at all anymore. <laughs> I, I started, I had this shocking revelation, and to be honest, this was 10 years ago, that I was now older than Hemingway ever lived to be, uh, which was disturbing because the town of Ketchum is full of all of these photographs of this stooped over old man who called himself Papa. 
and I was older than Papa. <laughs> you know? uh, but it, then it was sort of a liberating feeling. Um, the idea that I had all sorts of uh, decades ahead of me, hopefully, uh, that Hemingway never had. And I started thinking about how Hemingway in my life has always been there. Um, i give you a, a recent example. Uh, walking down West 86th Street in Manhattan, where I live, uh, just last week, a doorman, apropos of nothing, shouted out to me, hey, you look like Hemingway. <laughs> uh, my, my life has just been full of Hemingway coincidences, starting with the fact that I was actually in Idaho at the age of 12 when he killed himself. The newspaper said it was an accident. My father said it was suicide. I got really mad at my dad because, you know, I wanted to be a writer. And Hemingway was always in the press, that just the, the perfect ideal writer's life. And why would somebody with the ideal life kill themselves? And uh, this was very disturbing. Um, but I just started thinking about, you know, just everywhere. Uh, I lived in Paris for 10 years. I've written now about the Basques and, and in Spain okay. and France for almost 50 years. I've written about Cuba for... 40 years, and I regularly fish in Ketchum, Idaho. These are all Hemingway places. And uh, I didn't get to them because of Hemingway, <laughs> you know, but, you know, he was always there. Like Ketchum, for example, I went to because I was invited by the bass. There's a very big bass community in Idaho. And when I got there, I was thinking like, oh yeah, Hemingway, because his picture is everywhere, you know. <laughs> As I say, I say in the book that to, to, to be in Ketchum and not think about Hemingway would be like being in Sherwood Forest and never thinking of Robin Hood. Um, but it's, it's just kind of been like that everywhere I went. And so I, I slowly, took me 10 years, conceived of, I, I think, this sort of unique idea of doing a a memoir and a biography fused together. And it was difficult, it took me some time to figure out the right balance that I wanted to have. Hmm. Uh, I was wondering about that because there, there's this notion in the early part of the book of counterpoint. And both of you also amazingly studied the cello. Do you still play the cello, by the way? I still play the cello. Hemingway gave it up when he grew up. And I- But you, oh, but you still have one in the back there? You could bring I, it out? I do have one right over there. Do you really? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, but that notion of counterpoint seems, seems you know, to follow through. I discovered about the cello when I was researching this book. I hadn't known that. Huh. Uh, he mentioned it in a couple of interviews, and there are several cello metaphors in his writing. Um, but, you know, in researching the book, I, I kept finding all kinds of little coincidences like that. My favorite hotel in Chicago, the White Hall. I love the White Hall because it's this, this charming old hotel. It was Hemingway's favorite hotel on the oh. north side. But for Hemingway, it wasn't a charming old hotel. It was the, it was the brand new state-of-the-art hotel because he went in the 1920s. Um, the hotel that I used to stay in in New York when I was uh, a kid, a teenager, I'd come into New York and stay in Greenwich Village in this $4 a night hotel. Um, and in researching this book, I discovered that that's where he was billeted before he was shipped overseas for World War I. Oh, okay. I just keep running into these things. Right. And that notion of counterpoint is that these intersecting melodies go forward in one composition, and even though you were divided by many, many years, and also a very different approach to both writing and to your notions of peace and war and the natural world, there do seem to be throughout this book and through your lives this these, these meetings, these mel melodic meetings. I actually think that uh, on the subject of peace and war, we would have gotten along quite well. Um, you know, Hemingway, Hemingway created this fictitious, well, he was a fiction writer, you know, he created fictitious lots of things, told lots of stories, but he created this fictitious Hemingway who was the great soldier and everything. He was never a soldier, he hated war. And his, his writing is among the best anti-war writing of the 20th century. Farewell to Arms 
is one of the best anti-war novels ever written. Many of his short stories are anti-war. Um, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, that's one area, a lot of areas where we would differ. It's one of the few areas where we didn't. And one of the things that pulled me into Hemingway when I was a kid, and I read Farewell of the Arms, uh, at a time when um, this place, Vietnam, started to be mentioned more and more. And right. because my father and all my relatives were World War II veterans, I grew up with this idea that when I came of age, there would be a war waiting for me. And I recognized quite early that that war was going to be Vietnam. And I was thinking about it a lot. And I, I, I read A Farewell to Arms. And, uh, you know, I don't think I have ever been so grabbed by a book. Hmm. It's, it's a kind of ironic too, because what would what would a writer have been? What would he have been without those wars to kind of center his subject matter? Well, I wonder about that. Yeah, he t he talked about that about how wars were, you know, great for writers because everything was so condensed and you had these human experiences that were so intense. And you know, I, I thought about that uh, because um, you know I had always wanted to be a writer and I always wanted to do things that would be good for a writer. That's why I became a commercial fisherman. I thought this would give me great material. And so, so while I was opposing the Vietnam War, I was thinking, well, gee, I could get great material if I went. And then I thought, you know, do you really want to kill impoverished villagers so that you can have good experiences to write about? Um, so I became a conscientious objector. But, uh, uh, well, I was reading too on the, in the book about your two approaches to storytelling. I think this is around 122, 129 in the book, if anybody's out there is, is following along. And that he finds situations and characters to kind of carry the story for him. But when I was reading, going back and reading Salmon again too, you've done a lot of the same thing. Ole introduces us to this whole world of salmon fishery um, that that then uh, opens the story. That was yeah, that was I, fascinating. I, I, I often um, open books that way. My cod book is about a group of guys on a cod skiff off of uh, Newfoundland. Um, you know, my book also has an, about ten of my uh, watercolors, including the cover. And They're beautiful. And and one of them is a self portrait of me on that skiff in Newfoundland with the first cod I hand <laughs> It was It was the first cod you'd caught, so you, you had a chance to stop and... It wasn't the first cod I caught, it was the first cod that I'd caught by a hand line. Uh, oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> well, you'd written too, I know, it's centering on Hemingway, but Waverly Root is not somebody I'd, I'd heard of before. So it's, when you mention Waverly Roots and his impact on you while you were in I Paris... Know. Waverly Root was a huge influence on me. <clears throat> he was working, he was, by coincidence, we both came from Chicago papers, but I didn't know him that way. Um, uh, we were both writing for the International Herald Tribune in Paris at the same time. And he had this food column and wonderful food column and that was always sort of funny and engaging and a sense of history and culture. And this was at a time when I was thinking that Americans um, don't really approach food writing in that way, uh, which is quite common in France, certainly the Basques, uh, the Spanish, the Italians. And uh, I started writing, that's when I began writing food things for the International Herald Tribune. And um, he was really an inspiration for me. Because you, you, you do, you open the whole world through our relationship to the foods we catch and the foods we eat and salt, the elements around us too. It's almost, that was your entryway into literature instead yeah. of war. I mean, I wish, I, I wish writers wrote more about food. Um, some writer, Tolstoy wrote wonderfully about food and uh, Zola wrote fantastically about food. I translated a Zola novel that's all about food. Um, but, you know, like Hemingway, um, 
mentions food a lot, but he doesn't really write about it. He doesn't use it. We don't learn about the characters by the foods that they eat, or he doesn't set scenes with food. Right. Uh, he, he just ate a lot. <laughs> <laughs> he was a connoisseur. <laughs> Well, that, that is, everywhere he went, too, you, you keep on running into him. He seems to become the icon for the place that the place needs, but it never really was Hemingway. It was just the man Hemingway that that place needed <laughs> to, to idolize, especially in memory. I'm thinking of the, his influence on Spain, where they would, you wrote, they would um, <clears throat> just, just tear out all the parts of the novel they didn't want, Farewell to Arms, and then sell it that way. Why do you think he's such an icon? Well told, you know. Oh, right. Um, it's a very odd thing. Uh, uh, Hemingway uh, covered the Civil War um, from the Republican side, and he was very pro-Republican. And The only mention I've ever found of him crying in public was the day that the Republic fell. Hmm. And he absolutely hated Franco. And as did many people, and it was kind of a, not kind of, it was a boycotted country. Um, and yet he went back there and he'd go there and he'd get tremendous publicity. And uh, it was helping the Spanish government try to rebuild the tourist industry. And I don't know why he did that. I mean, selfishness, I guess. He, he loved Spain more than he hated Franco. Um, but uh, uh, Valerie Jambi, who uh, was his uh, secretary and later became uh, uh, his son Gregory's wife and uh, traveled around Spain with him. And she was the ex-wife of the Irish, very rebellious writer, Brendan Bean. And she told me that Brendan Bean decided to go to Spain. And at the border, the officials interviewed him and they said, and what do you want to see when you go to Spain? And he said, I want to see Franco's funeral. <laughs> <laughs> and so they wouldn't let him in. I would have <laughs> there been a Hemingway story like that. Yeah. <laughs> oh. there, so there was his presence in Paris. So Paris, we've, when the book goes from Paris to Spain, to Cuba and then and then back to Idaho chronologically too and it follows in, in some sense your own chronological development as a writer yeah the uh but the, you know it's, it's funny because some places Paris the Paris that I went to in 1970 was yeah. like the Paris he went to in the 1920s right. you know he uh he went to Paris at a time when you know, all these Americans were going to Paris because the dollar was uh, very strong against the franc. And it was just incredibly cheap to live in Paris. Um, and, you know, all of this nonsense and movable feast about him, you know, being poor and struggling. I mean, also his wife had a trust fund. But, you know, <laughs> you know look out for anybody who romanticizes poverty. Anybody who's been poor never finds poverty romantic. Um, but the other, th the other thing that was different, I mean, when I went, the franc was extremely strong against the dollar and Paris was extremely expensive. Um, there were lots of writers there. But when Hemingway was there, the writers were, um, they were developing the modernist movement, not only writers, but uh, painters and musicians and modernism was, it was everywhere. It was in London, it was the Harlem Renaissance, it was in Chicago. Uh, but Paris became a center of modernism. And Hemingway was an avant-garde writer trying to create a new way of writing as were Ezra Pound and all these people. Um, uh, when I went to Paris, the writers who were there were not trying to find a new way of writing. They were trying to do an old way of writing. <laughs> they were trying to be like Hemingway. Um, whenever you try to be like an old writer, um, it's a recipe for disaster. <laughs> um, but the odd thing is when I went to Spain, 
that was the Spain that Hemingway knew. Mm. Uh, I, I went to Spain, Franco was in power. It was a fascist dictatorship. People were walking here around giving fascist salutes. Uh, I'd be interviewing somebody in their office and there would be the Iron Cross proudly displayed that Hitler had awarded them for their service to the Third Reich. Um, it, would, wow. it was this time warp into the 1930s. Hmm. You were talking about Spain, that, that Spain had um, a better notion of its past. It might be able to move beyond it. That's, that's a bastardization of what you'd written in there. But I wonder if you see any parallels, if we dare go there with the, what uh, the American history, um, how our limitations of our own well, I, I, acceptance I, of our history. Well, I've been thinking about this a lot. <clears throat> um, Franco died in 1975. Hmm. And in 1982, the Guardia Civil uh, attacked the Congress and tried to do a coup d'etat that failed. And the Spanish response was, well, this is a warning. You can't get the extreme right too upset or we're just going to have a lot of political instability. So they smoothed over. Nobody was ever tried for fascist crimes. Uh, Franco's great monument was, was preserved and made into a tourist place even. And wow. um, uh, nothing was ever done to uh, attack that dark past. And in recent years, um, the Spanish have come to regret it and realize that they were paying a price for it. And they've closed down that monument and they're, ch they're changing a lot of things. And uh, you can guess where, I've been, <laughs> where I'm going with this. You know, I, yeah. I'm watching these January 6th hearings and I'm thinking that if the U.S. government doesn't respond to this, if they just try to smooth it over because they don't want to upset the extreme right, it'll be the same mistake and we'll be paying for it for decades as Spain did. Yeah, I don't know. I can't remember now if this was your quote or someone else, but the, uh, or, or who you, if you were quoting someone, but you said the Spanish tend to turn their back on their history and so it does not go away. Yeah, well, that's, that's the great lesson. You turn yeah. your back on your history, it, it, it just stays there. Right, right. There's so many elements, um, <laughs> food for, for one thing too, that I, I'd love to just talk about all of your books. But do you think there's a through line beyond food? Is there something more elemental than food that's drawn you to these topics? Both Hemingway and, I mean, his, his obsession with fishing really that, that, that links these two seemingly desperate passions of yours? Well, Really, what Hemingway was all about, and what I'm all about, is books. Huh. I've spent my life with books, and Hemingway spent his life with books, and there's nothing he cared about more than books. Despite yeah. all of that stuff, uh, but Valerie said to me, you know, if you really wanted to, to get Hemingway, you know, you weren't talking about fishing, you weren't talking about boxing or bullfighting. You could sit down and talk to him about books. He was incredible. Mm. Books or paintings. Is that what you would like to do if you were going to have a chance to chat, sit down and chat with him? He, yeah, what I most want to talk to him about, because I noticed in an interview that he said that he had learned things about writing from Bach. And this is one of my pet theories. Uh, I love Bach as any cellist would. And uh, I think that you can learn a tremendous amount about writing from the way Bach wrote. And uh, if I could just sit down with Hemingway, I would love to talk to him about this idea. Well, well talk to us about it. What, I mean, this notion of counterpoint again, what is it about Bach that, that you think? Uh, prelude and fuse, themes and variations. So you, you, uh. you, you set something up, you establish rhythms through through repetition, um, you um, uh, explore something frontwards and then sideways, and then you bring it up again backwards. Um, uh, music, uh, musicologists sometimes say that, that Bach did variations both horizontally and vertically. Yeah, I've read that in the book, but I wasn't sure what that meant. I mean, musically, I didn't know, I don't know enough about music to know what that meant. Um, 
Well, you know, you, you, you have a variation and then, you know, you, you change the key and you do the same theme in a different vari in a variation in a different key. And then you is it possible to do it on the cello? Or is that too, is it too weird to grab it? Me to do it right now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you're going to be expecting Yo-Yo Ma and you're going to get... Yeah. <laughs> Maybe the, the after concert, we could do that, but that, that that's, <laughs> but I do see that throughout. There's the, there's the intertwining stories separated by time, but then you keep meeting, you keep meeting. And also our alimentary habits too, how our themes and variations over time. History seems necessary or a time signature, whether it's history or a time signature in music necessary. Dorian Ching, uh, Chong on the, um, Comments wants to know what is known about Hemingway's death. Why did he kill himself? Oh, well, um, first of all, you have to say that he spent a great deal of his life. First of all, there's the whole weird thing about the Hemingways. Mm. They call it the family accident. No, his father killed himself, his uncle did, his brother did, one of his sisters did. Wow. Uh, one of his uh, granddaughters did. There's something chemical going on there. I don't know exactly what it is, if it's manic depression or something. Um, but he, you know, he often talked about suicide. Uh, I think because his father killed himself. Um, but... Uh, he started going to the Mayo Clinic and getting shock treatments. This is when he was living in Idaho. And what these shock treatments did is they destroyed his memory. Mm. Memory is everything for a writer. And Hemingway had an incredible, incredible memory. I mean, he never took notes. Um, you know, all this stuff we know about Hemingway, this was all in his head with three times the detail. And, you know, he could write and, and, and recall something that, that happened in 1923 and use it mm. story. And uh, uh, when this was gone, when memory was gone, he couldn't write anymore. Um, and I think he, you know, he always talked about the idea that, you know, you, you, you you pick your time to go, and he thought this was the time to go. And his, his whole obsession with bullfighting, you know, bullfighting, it's a mistranslation. It's not called fighting in Spanish, and it's, there's no fight, and there's no winner or loser. There's a question who loses. The bull dies, <laughs> and it's all about how well the bull dies. It's, right. about, it's a metaphor for the idea that everybody's going to die. How well do you do? Right. And this was something that he was very involved in on all kinds of levels. And, and he reached a point where he thought, you know, this is the time. Right. And you talk about his tragic view of life. And that was the one primary difference between he and you is that you don't have that tragic view of life. Is that still true after the book's published even? Yeah, I mean, I, I just can't manage to be as unhappy as he was. <laughs> Um, Pat asked, "Did you have you seen the Ken Burns documentary um, on Hemingway?" I haven't. I haven't. I I, I happened to uh, do a show with Ken when he was working on it, and we, we talked about it. But uh, but I haven't actually seen it. And Roy wants to know more again about. I'm sorry, I opened up can of words with box counterpoint style. Can he? He loves you to expand on that. <laughs> Did you think you were going to be doing a music lesson? <laughs> Yeah, you know, it, it's uh, a huge influence, not really on writing, but on music. I mean, you know, if, if you think about something like uh, Miles Davis kind of blue or uh, Jimmy mm -hmm. uh, Riff on the Star Spangled Banner, uh, this is right out of Bach. This is Takata and Fugue. You set up a theme and you do variations. Um, uh, just a, a, a huge influence in how we do all kinds of things. Uh, music was never the same. Um, uh, right, rhythm is extremely important. 
in writing. Mm. And Hemingway once said that he learned about how to set up rhythms from Bach. He also once said he learned it from Gertrude Stein. So I, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, well, that was the Paris enclave of Stein and all of these books. Gertrude Stein was an interesting case because Gertrude Stein was so experimental. She was basically unreadable. Nobody, <laughs> nobody could really publish her. She was wealthy and she published herself. And Hemingway was very impressed with these experiments that she did, but he didn't want to be like that. He wanted to be a popular writer. Right. He wanted to be read. Right. Yeah. So there was a book. Oh, sorry. There's there's a book. Uh, Ginny Erpenbeck has the Visitation. It's a German um, translation that I read. But I, after reading your, this book and then reading that, that book's all about variations on the theme. And then to find out she's also an opera director in. Germany it made a lot of sense that the musicality of her book was translated that way. Well, yeah. you know, rhythm is, is so important to writing and, and how yeah. you set up rhythm. I never listen to music while I write because I don't want to impose somebody else's rhythm. On right. My right. Uh, but, you know, how do you establish rhythm uh, through, through uh, rep repetition to, you know, and you know, you can do Gertrude Stein repetition or roses, roses, roses. <laughs> but, you know, you can also do more evolved kind of repetition where you repeat, but you change something. Yeah, variation. Ur 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 Ursula Le Guin has something about that, like beneath memory and experience, I'm reading off the wall, that's why I'm looking up. Beneath imagination, invention, beneath words, there are rhythms to which memory and imagination and words all move. The writer's job is to go down deep enough to feel that rhythm, find it, move to it, be moved by it, and let it move memory and Im imagination to find words. Yeah, you're right. That's written on the ceiling. Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of, yeah. My wall is full of writer's words. Yeah. <laughs> Ursula is looking back at me, but but that struck me as similar. Like there's a, there's a deeper level of knowledge that comes after you've ingested all of the research that you have to do. And how do you, how do you create a narrative out of that right. after being overwhelmed? We're in a, mo in a moment when we're so overwhelmed with information and yet it seems to lack any kind of rhythmic sense. Hmm. Like, yeah, yeah. And, and, and there's another thing also, um, this is why I don't like to try to teach writing. Mm. Uh, writing is really about your voice so it's really questionable if you can teach somebody else how to write because they have to work with their voice um, right. and you know some people have better voices than others that's what Hemingway was Hemingway had an incredible voice you know one or two sentences and you're there pulls you in just, just by his voice the war was always going on, but we would not go to it anymore. You know, but that, even that one sentence is a is a counterpoint, isn't it? The war would not go on, but we would not go to it. That's my favorite Hemingway sentence. <laughs> oh, I think I probably stole it from your book, but no. I <laughs> well, Pat wonders too. Um, why is it? I mean, is it is it this rhythm? Is it this moment he lived? Is it his persona that he created? Why is it that he lived so large in our imagination? That, well, that's partly the persona. But uh. created, but um, you know what it really is all about fundamentally is that we love his books, uh. and why do we love his books? Because it's this voice, it's the man. It's like, yeah, I want to talk to this guy. <laughs> you know, mm. it just pulls you in. Uh, it's just so uh, interesting and. Uh, um, uh, it's just, just, you know, Hemingway, you can pick it up anywhere and it just completely pulls you in. I always think about, I taught for a semester at uh, Bernard Borough College, which is part of the City College in New York. Uh, great class, had a bunch of uh, 18 honor students. And it was a course in nonfiction. And I gave them different things to read. I gave them Orwell and all kinds of things. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to give him 
give them some really bad Hemingway nonfiction. <laughs> but <laughs> I think the worst thing he ever wrote, which is called Dangerous Summer, which he was supposed to write for Life magazine. And it's about this competition between these two matadors. And um, it's really sexist the way he describes women and the difference between how he describes women and how he describes men. And, you know, a lot of things wrong with it. I thought, well, let me give this to these, you know, 20 year olds and see what they make of it. To my surprise, they all loved it. Really? Yeah. Because of the rhythm. Because of the voice, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. I was doing that after I read your book. I just got a bunch of Hemingways and I would just open any page and just, just read aloud to myself just to listen to the way the words are put together. Yeah, I mean, it's just irresistible. But then in his, his ongoing debate with Faulkner about what a sentence should be. <laughs> Well, yeah, that that's fascinating too. I, I wonder if you're stripping down everything. He was trying to get at the truth, so you strip but, down all. The idea of stripping down is what modernism is all about. You know, ah. Pound told him not to use adjectives. Yeah. Which he fortunately didn't listen to, but he used fewer adjectives. <laughs> and um, this is very much, you know, there's this thing that's often said about how Hemingway was. Uh, uh, correspondent and you had to pay by word to cable your stories and, and that's how he developed this style. I don't think that's true at all. It was modernism. It was, you know, what Ezra Pound was talking about. It's what right. all of them were talking about. And, you know, it's what William Carlos Williams is about. And um, I wonder if it was a response to the propaganda that was in flowering language telling them untruths constantly. Yeah, I mean, broader than that, the, the, the flowering language, but the flowering everything, you know. Yeah, a 19th century novel, of course, was. Well, the amount of hot air that <laughs> in World War One, Yeah. And, and preceded such a pointless, horrible slaughter. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that that was, although modernism began actually before World War One. I was reading Cather's One of Our Own and really enjoy the first half of that book while the young man is on the farm. And then I, she wrote it before, I think she wrote it before World War I. And I don't know that she could have written that book the way she'd written that with the glorification of the death of this young man after World War I. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it, changed, it changed that generation and yeah. One of the things you need to understand about Hemingway is that even more than Fitzgerald, he was the writer of his generation. Huh. And, you know, um, when uh, The Sun Also Rises came out, huge bestseller, it was people his age buying it. Huh. People, 20 year olds, people who'd been through World War I, you know, uh, reading this book and saying, yeah, you know. This guy gets what we're about. Yeah. So where are we now? Who is that? Who is our Hemingway? Do we have one? Um, I don't know. Um, you know, I mean, it took about 50 years to realize that Hemingway was. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, it's an interesting question who who best captures our times. Um, well, maybe, maybe our times demand more than one voice too. I think that seems that polyphony, phonic yeah, actually, moment. That, that idea of the writer is not yeah. for our times. Um, uh, I think, uh, well, you know, like Hemingway, I come from a generation, a famous generation, you know, the generation of the 60s. And very, yeah. We have a very strong idea of who we are. And I, you know, I connect with uh, people of my generation. And, and I think, you know, if you're not of my generation, you might not notice it. But if you are of my generation, you would see that my books are definitely written by somebody of the 60s generation. 
Um, well, respect for the land and respect for the natural world and the way in which we live within it I think is, is obvious throughout your books. It's one of the things I love about the books. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, also, a distrust of government. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, um, I refused to serve in Vietnam. I was drafted and I refused to go. And I had a considerable discussion with the powers that be about that. And um, I was headed for Canada, but then the war ended. And at various times in my life, I still find myself saying, should have gone to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right then when you had the chance. Well, you went you went to the fisheries, but you were also an actor for a time. And that, that must have impacted the way in which you understand language. And Well, more than that, I, I was a playwright. And now ah, I, right. Uh, I was a theater major in college. My degree is in theater. Okay. And, and afterwards, I became a newspaper journalist. And those two things are a great background for a writer in tandem because theater teaches you how to write dialogue, how to set scenes, how to build characters. Um, newspapers don't teach you anything about writing, but they teach you how to get into places and meet people and <laughs> things like that. Um, get your facts, well, hopefully get your facts right, I suppose. But I mean, I'm sure that my writing was, and, and I started off as a playwright and wrote some plays, even had some produced. and. Um, you never been tempted to do that again, to go back to playwriting? Uh, I would have to find, I would, I, would, I would have to live in a community that had a theater that really expressed that community. Ah, okay. Because, um, you know, I live in New York and Broadway doesn't express anything about living in New York. <laughs> <laughs> even, even the things that are the rent things that are supposed yeah. to uh you know the, the problem with broadway is that it's it's tailored for out-of-towners so uh it's sort of the out-of-town view of new york and have you been there most of your writers i mean you've been all over the place but how long have you been based there too long <laughs> you want to go back to idaho i hear like, everybody's going to idaho right now yeah, I was, yeah. <laughs> no. I, I was in paris for about 10 years and i uh, lived in mexico and uh, uh i lived in miami when i was covering the caribbean um i even lived in san francisco for a couple of years um but basically what happened is i raised my kid in new york mm, sure now she just graduated from college, so I guess she's an adult. So what do I get? She's a New Yorker, you know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, congratulations to her and to you for that, and and for the book. I, I we we kind of talked around it, but I think the readers are going to have a real treat just to follow these two stories through time and to these four distinct places in time: Paris in the 1930s, right, and Paris <laughs> later, whenever you were there. But that. <laughs> That parallel, going back and forth and allowing me to compare the two places and the two kinds of writing lives was for a writer, but even just for an artist, I think it'd be fascinating. Yeah, I, I think to a large extent, the book is about a writing life, you know, mm. what a writing life is. If you could sum that up, what a writing life is, how would you do that? Well, um, it's isolated in a way. I mean, you have to you have to really like being alone. Mm -hmm. uh, um, because being alone is is when it's not, not just to write but to think. Um, you know, I, uh, people report on me to my wife, you know, they say, oh, I saw your husband the other day and I don't know what was wrong with him. He was just off somewhere. He didn't say hello. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I, thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, sorry to butt in. I want to be very um, aware of Mark being on the East Coast and, uh, oh, that's right. you know, 
it's, it's dark where you are. It's still light out here. Um, I do want to, first of all, congratulate you, Mark, because the first printing of your book sold out right away. We are waiting for the second printing to arrive. So Arinda Books is also sold out of what we ordered, and we've got more on order. And I highly encourage people to pick it up because if nothing else, the watercolors that Mark has done are really, really charming. Um, they're worth it. And you're not going to get that on your Kindle, I don't think. Um, but no, it's a very good book. Well, I don't and get a Kindle, do you? I don't know. I don't know. I've they come, they're not great. I've looked at both versions and they're black and white on the Kindle so you don't get the full experience. Oh. But oh. <laughs> I know, I know, black and white water was, go for you. Yeah, but, um, <laughs> so you have to buy, you have to buy both one to take with you and then one to admire. Yeah. Well, folks, don't buy the Kindle. <laughs> oh, right, yeah. Yeah, not the Kindle, not the Kindle. Um, but anyway, I want to think, I do have one parting question. When I went through your long bio, I saw that it was 2001, you were, a, you were awarded an ambassadorship from the government, uh, from the Basque government. Yep. What, does that what does that entitle you to? Are you still an ambassador? I, I am. The honorary? It, um, it, it's called an ambassador of Chocolat. Chocolate is a kind of Basque wine. Ooh. Ah. Oh, okay. It's supposed to entitle me to some chocolate, but I have to go there to get it. <laughs> but after I after I was awarded the ambassadorship, uh, there's a Basque language uh, television channel that interviewed me, and they they asked me just what you did. What what are you going to do as ambassador? Uh -huh. and, my glass of chocolate because not easy to say things in Basque. <laughs> I just <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Mark, okay, I, I was gonna leave on that note, but we actually have a question that popped up, which I think is um, really worthwhile. Uh, Dorian is um, talking about um, the Hemingway of our time, and she suggests that American Pastoral by Philip Roth is the great portrayal of the baby boomer generation. And she's asking, what do you think of that? Yeah, so we're talking, we're not talking about our time. We're talking about my generation. Your time, yes. yes. Okay, well, that's our, our time, right? <laughs> Mary, you're too young. <laughs> not Mary's time, our time. <laughs> um, yeah, I, th I, th I think so. Um, uh, well, a number of things come to mind, you know, Catch-22, mm. um, uh, Slaughterhouse-Five, um, uh, um, maybe, you know, some of Tim O'Brien's books about Vietnam, but... Oh, the things they carry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't know that any book ever... I mean, Vietnam was such a huge thing in all of our lives, and... I don't know that any book has ever captured it the way it's done what Hemingway did for World War I. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And failed to do for World War II, by the way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Fair enough. And I see that you are surrounded by books. And so my parting question is, what are you reading now? Ah, uh, well, two parts of this question. I am reading, I'm researching a book that I'm uh, working on, which actually would probably interest you, Mary, a lot. Uh, it's about um, Boston abolitionists in the first part of the uh, 19th century, yeah. how they tried to build a nonviolent movement and how step by step, you know, what they were trying to avoid was the Civil War and how it step by step, they moved away, you know, the, 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 the Kansas and the Fugitive Slave Act and finally John Brown and, and right. uh, uh, lost that opportunity, the belief that um, it was going to be very difficult after you ended slavery to bring the one-time slave owners around and you weren't going to be able to work with them if there had been the bitterness of a war. Right, um, which is true. Prophetic view of history. Yeah. So I've been reading a lot of stuff for that. In the meantime, I snuck in a book, a wonderful book called Old Poets. I don't know if you've run across this book. It is by um, uh, Donald 
Hall, who was a poet laureate and happened to know, he knew T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound and Robert Frost and uh, Dylan Thomas and all these people. And it's a book about his encounters with all of these poets when they were old. And it's a fant fantastic book. I recommend it. Okay. Well, thank you for that. You could pick that up after you read The Importance of Not Being Earnest. So, <laughs> so Mark, I want to thank you so much for giving up an hour of your evening. Mary, as always, thank you for being our go-to in-conversation partner. And to all of the people who are watching this, I thank you for spending some time with us. So um, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Thank you, Mark. <laughs>